And I'll tell you, it's, it's very unique to have the local government stepping up and, and leading a process like this. It's, it's really innovative and it's fully founded in the public interest and it's articulated in these five goals of thinking about encouraging private sector investment and job creation on the site. Promoting recreational and public access to the property. Currently, access is restricted up at Northern State for security and safety reasons. Protecting the environmentally sensitive areas, especially Hanson Creek, where the county and the um, Upper Skagit Tribe have made a significant investment in habitat restoration. Acknowledging and protecting the historic significance of the site. Um, the Northern State Hospital was recently um, included on the National Register of Historic Places. And it's not just for the buildings, but actually a whole district going from the old hospital campus over to the farmhouse buildings has been designated as this historic district. The buildings themselves as well as the landscape. This was a site planned out by the Olmsted brothers, one of the most famous landscape architecture firms in the country. They've done uh, park and open space plans from, um, from New York City, Central Park, um, to out here in the Northwest in Seattle and Portland, their city park plans as well. Um, and uh, again, to uh, mention the Upper Skagit Tribe, that they're specifically called out in these goals as a neighbor to the property of being a special uh, stakeholder in this process. Jim briefly mentioned the, the project team. So the city, county, and port have coordinated, and with the port acting as, um, as kind of the, the lead contracting agency, they've um, through a competitive process, hired us, um, Mal Foster Alonji, to lead this planning process, and we in turn have brought together a team of experts. Jim mentioned a few of them, um, our architects and our planners, but I'd like to also mention um, that we have a transportation um, expert in uh, Victor Salomon here. Um, we have a uh, wetland and natural resource um, expert in Ross Widener in the back. Um, we also have brought on folks to, with expertise in cultural resources to look at um, not only the historic buildings, but also artifacts that could be pre-settlement that are in, under the ground. Um, and geotechnical um, to look at concerns about slope stability um, and what it would take to be able to, to build on the site. So, and uh, as well as the economics of this piece, looking at um, what's the job creation potential here, what's going to be the economic spin-off benefits for um, uh, payroll as well as tax revenues, so that we can think about these different implications of the project from, a, from this broad, comprehensive perspective. So when we think about the environmental review process um, we, and, and these land use planning, I want to just be fundamental about what's our purpose here? What, what are we trying to achieve? And I think we've articulated here in this state about saying that we're trying to achieve, a, by trying to encourage a set of uses on the site that's going to revitalize the historic campus. This was once a, a thriving, self-sustaining community as it was originally designed with you know, the hospital buildings, residences, um, commissary, cafeteria. There was the farm. They were producing enough food both to sustain themselves as well as to export to other hospitals around the state. Um, in fact, that's why it was sited in this location was to be in the fertile Skagit Valley so that they could produce food. That mix of uses was integral to the success of it as functioning as a hospital. And we think that a mix of uses that are compatible are going to be key to revitalizing the property in the future. It's too big for there to be one single user out there. It's going to take multiple parties working together to create the lift. And the fact that it is a campus and that has a historic character are, are the two overarching characteristics that make this a unique place and a place that's more, that has value for it. So to get it to revitalize, it's going to need to take advantage of the fact that it has this campus attributes um, and that it has that unique historic character. Businesses, um, institutions can locate anywhere. Why they want to come here is going to be because of that campus character and that historic character. And there's some sore needs. Um, the, the hospital closed about 40 years ago. Since then, the, uh, the facility has been slowly coming into decline. The state has been managing as, as best as they can. They've got a great dedicated crew of maintenance workers up there, but they've got limited resources to take care of what amounts to over 500,000 square feet of building space out there. So some of those buildings are, are in degrading condition. We've had architects look at them, and we think there is opportunity to, um, to renovate and restore them. But there's a, there's a window of time there um, where that's going to be viable, and after a while it may not be. Um, and as that site has been operated over time, um, some of those old historic buildings have been demolished, um, like the old supervisor's uh, residence is gone now. Um, and some new buildings have been built that are incompatible with that historic character, that don't match that historic design, don't match that historic layout. 
another concern about the facility is that you know, there's no private investment. It, it began as a public enterprise to provide mental health services, and that was a, a, a great undertaking, And but there hasn't been sufficient resources invested from the public sector to be able to maintain that, that large of a facility. So we think it's going to take a mix of public and private investment to be able to bring that back. So the work that's ongoing, Jim mentioned those tracks. This shows them in a this kind of simplified work plan diagram. There's the city annexation process. And then in the middle there is the, uh, the, the planning for the sub-area plan and this environmental review process. And the, the uh, where this is all trying to lead is to set the property up from a regulatory perspective so that the policies and guidelines are in place that future development can be permitted up there. So the Janneke proposals would, would come in as specific development projects after this process is completed. And here's our schedule. It's on the board in the back um, for the sub-area plan and the environmental review, which is what we're focusing on tonight. So this is our, our first big uh, public discussion about this. We'll be back again to talk to you in the summertime when we have some draft products to show you. But tonight it's to help you, think, help you see some of our thinking about the site and to get your input as we kick off this environmental review. We want to hear your thoughts on what are the important issues or questions that you want to see addressed as we go through this review process. So what is a sub-area plan? What's the point of this? Um, as you're all aware, the city has a comprehensive plan, and that sets up the long-range framework for development of the city. It thinks through things like economic development, housing, infrastructure. A sub-area plan allows a municipality to have that same kind of long-range thinking about development of an area, but focus it in a, in a smaller area. And that, by having that, that small geographic focus, you can get into more detail. So what the sub-area plan will do is it will articulate goals and policies that will guide development here, and it will help identify what infrastructure improvements, what capital investments need to be made to support redevelopment of the property. And in conjunction with this, we're conducting the environmental review up front as a planned action. And this is a little bit different, and usually when we have environmental review, it's on a very specific project. Somebody wants to go build a building, then you review that specific piece, and you try to think about how it fits into the bigger world around it. By doing the environmental review with the long-range plan, we have the benefit of being able to think long-term and think on a bigger scale. So we're not just thinking about a single building asking for a permit out there, but we're thinking about the whole 225-acre property and thinking about long-term, 20, 50 years from now, what are the impacts of this plan for redevelopment. So tonight we want to um, share with you what our, um, what our general concepts are for redevelopment of the site. And these are based on the planning process that we conducted last year, looking at what we think are going to be economically viable, um, what we think is going to work with the historic architecture, the historic buildings in the site, uh, what we think there's market opportunities for, and also what we've heard back from the community when we asked you last year what type of uses you wanted to see on the site. We tried to bring all those things together in a way that's cohesive and is, is um, pays attention to each of those different perspectives. So now I'd like to um, bring uh, Jeff McClure up to comment about the historic plan, this original Olmsted plan, what makes it so unique and special, and walk you through these concepts that we'll review underneath the environmental impact statement for future use of the property. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the considerations that we had when we were going through the master planning process. And as Mike mentioned, the property has such a remarkable history having been uh, designed by the Olmstead brothers. So before we even lifted a pencil, we wanted to make certain that we understood what the, what the rudiments of that plan are, what the elements were, so as we move through the process, we'd be able to respect that. I know that all of you have probably been up on the site, and so you know that it's just kind of this pristine and very pastoral setting that these buildings are set in. It's a very, I don't know, my, my sense is a very calming atmosphere. I think part of that is this predictable and orderly layout. Um, the site slopes toward the southeast, so all the buildings, or most of the buildings, can take advantage of uh, these wonderful mountainous views. And it has a very rational layout. There's these series of ring roads almost laid down uh, like ribbons uh, along the contours, so that all these buildings can kind of be laid out in a very rational and predictable way. 
counter to that is the central spine of the main buildings, the Denny Administration Building, the Assembly Hall, and the Dining Hall are kind of the central spine that all of these residential buildings are, are um, um, related to. And it creates this real rational order to the site that I think is, was intentionally peaceful and very calm. Um, um, I mentioned these expansive lawns um, that these buildings are set into, and I think it creates this calming appearance, terrace topography. And then um, amidst this land plan, then, of course, this intentional campus architecture. All the buildings are built in this Spanish revival style, very limited palette of materials, stucco walls with tile roofs. Everything is tied together. Um, and we want to make certain that whatever we do in terms of inserting new buildings into this uh, into this landscape is very, very respectful of these kind of basic tenets. So as we moved into the land plan, we'll go to the next slide. The other thing that we need to be aware of, you can see this area in yellow. Um, of course, the entry to the site is at the lower left-hand side of the slide, but the area in yellow is really our core historic area. This is the bulk of where most of the buildings um, are, um, um, are, are present, and we want to do everything that we can to kind of enhance this same sort of design. On the south and to the north are what we're calling influence areas, and this is where we felt that we would be able to insert some of these larger buildings that are, that are going to be able to support support the research and development and the, and the manufacturing, creating a public face toward the main campus, the center portion of the campus, but keeping the more light industrial portions facing away from the campus so we can preserve this same sort of spirit. So if you, when we move through into these next slides, then you can see how we've inserted some of this new construction into these influence areas. So there are three really alternatives that we're looking at in the EIS process, then they go from the lowest amount of construction or development to the other end on the bookends. So the first one is this no action, the EIS. It's basically the status quo. We have uses on the site now. Some are long-term leases, some are short-term leases. There's no predictability exactly how, about, how long that these would last. Many of the buildings are, some of the buildings are occupied, many are not. So if we do nothing, the likelihood that the existing historical resources that are on site will be minimally maintained as resources allow, but probably continue to spiral down into some, at some point they cross the threshold where they're no longer uh, no longer uh, habitable or, or able to be restored. So that's one aspect of it. The next one is more of our moderate. Next slide, please. Thank you. The next slide is the moderate intensity slide. And so here, the buildings in blue, the darker blue, are the buildings that are historically significant on site and part of this historic campus. There are a couple of light blue buildings you see, the, uh, uh, the recreation building off to the right-hand side and the extension of a storage building up toward the upper portion, which are newer structures but still probably could be repurposed in some way. Um, oh, got a pointer. Thank you, Steve. I'll try not to hit you in the back of the head there. Okay, good. So, uh, and as I said, this is the historic core of the campus here. And you can see that these building pads down here indicate where we see these development zones. Each of these pads are about uh, 50,000 square feet for a total of 200,000 square feet. They're, they have a public face pointing toward the campus, as I said, where the offices likely would be, and then the more uh, uh, the manufacturing side of the operation would be facing in this direction. They've been spaced apart so that the central core has continues with these unobstructed views to the site, as was the original intention of the Olmstead plan. Um, one of the other insertions here, this is the location of an historic parking garage that was built originally serving the campus, and our intent would be to provide some of the parking on the periphery of this, again, so we don't have to start uh, pockmarking the original campus with a bunch of large parking areas. So again, really trying to keep that historic core intact so that we keep this uh, peacefulness of the central campus. The more intensive version of this on the upper end of the scale is the next slide. 
So now you're seeing these same buildings intact, but we're also providing another 100,000 square foot potential up on the northern edge of the campus. And again, the same concept is true. The public side, the public facade of this building pointing into this campus core, but then the more, uh, uh, the more manufacturing side or research and development would, would face to the north. Um, so we're ringing we're ringing this with those public faces of the building. Now, in order to test the assumptions of a more intensified plan, we've also put another building down in this particular location, which is, which from a topography point of view is lower, so we're figuring that if we need to do this building, that might be a place of least disruption. And then you're also seeing in the uh, main campus some other orange shaded pads. These are the locations of former buildings that are no longer there. Um, but if we need to add um, uh, more square footage in the center part of the campus, this would be the most respectful place to do it. Still keeping with the organization of the buildings along these, um, along these ring roads. So as I said, we've got a no action scheme, a high action scheme, and one kind of in the middle. I suspect that the final alternative, once we get through all of the analysis, will be somewhere between the moderate intensity and the high intensity plan. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. And so, uh, to add to the, those uses, you know, obviously those those buildings that Jeff pointed to on the southern end look um, those would be kind of for pilot scale fabrication that's pointing towards the the Janik Industries buildings, um, and then the buildings in the historic core would be amenable for uses of office space, research and development. You can think of like a university has classrooms, offices, as well as interior lab space, those types of uses, as well as potentially hospitality, restaurants, other types of uses that would be complementary to having a, a, a campus setting again, where people could work, have places to eat, have places to gather, and have a lot of interaction in that campus. And we'll, we'll have Peter come up in a few minutes here and speak to a little bit about his, his vision for Janicki Bioenergy operating in a campus setting. Um, but. In summary, though, these EIS alternatives, um, the no action, moderate, and high intensity, as Jeff laid out. This uh, on the board here, you can see the, um, the, the statistics on those in terms of amount of square footage they each entail. It's interesting to note that um, there's existing over 500,000 square feet of building space there. So when we talk about moderate intensity, we're only talking about 600,000 square feet of building space. So we're talking about um, not actually a lot of increase of developed space there because in time we'd be removing some of those incompatible buildings while we're building new. So you're going to have kind of a, a net, not much of a difference, um, but you would have a lot more employment, a lot more people on campus, which is going to generate more trip traffic, which our transportation study will look at. Um, and um, when we look at the high intensity, we have that, we kind of build on that moderate, we're removing some of the incompatible buildings, building, putting in new, and then adding higher density to that. So you'll see the, the environmental review will go through and analyze these three options, and they're really like a fit test. Um, the, the, we did the, the plan layout to get a sense about where things could best fit, um, but the environmental review will look at, you know, what were the impacts of having that kind of development out there? And then the, you know, when it gets down to specific design of a building, we'll be setting up the framework in the, in the sub-area plan about what process would someone have to go through to get a permit to be able to build an actual building there. So when we do the environmental review, and the focus of uh, one of the focus of tonight's meeting is what aspects are important to look at. Um, the, the State Environmental Policy Act sets up the, the parameters for doing an environmental review, and they're really broad. Um, the natural and built environment are, are all considered, and you really want to think about what's most relevant to your project. And working with the city as the lead SEPA official on this, the, the lead agency that will be responsible for, for carrying forward the environmental review process, we've identified these key areas of thinking about the natural environment. There's the earth, looking at that, that geotechnical study, um, thinking about what the, uh, what the parameters are for being able to build on this, on this physical ground. Think about water. There are three streams that run through the property, Hanson Creek, Brickyard Creek, and there's an unnamed creek. And there's some wetlands associated with those. So when we, we're trying to, as we do this planning, think about avoiding impacts to those wetlands or minimizing them as we can. We'll think through that process in the environmental review. 
they call it fish and wildlife. Um, some of those streams are salmon bearing. Um, there's a unique feature on the campus that the old, there's the old power plant. There's a central power plant in the facility that used to have, that had a smokestack. The smokestack's still there, but it's no longer operational. And while we turned the, the uh, smoke out of the, turned the smoke off, birds came in. And there, are, there is a, a regionally significant um, Vox's swift. It's a little tiny bird that loves to live in chimneys. They, they're here. They're in Monroe. They're in a chimney stack down in Portland. And uh, the Audubon has gone out and done regular counts of them in the thousands. These birds come in and just spiral into this uh, into this chimney stack. So there's some unique features out there to be uh, concerned about. Um, we want to think about environmental health as well. Um, the property is operated for 100 years as basically a self-sustaining city. So there are operations like that power plant that used to bring in coal and bunker C fuel. They used to have some landfilling operations. They had a laundry. Um, they had mechanical operations out there to fix vehicles and equipment. So over time, those type of, type of uh, operations can leave some impacts, some contamination of petroleum and other things in the soil and groundwater. So we're looking at that from a, an environmental health perspective. And then in the built environment, we're thinking a lot about land use compatibility. It's a big property, 225 acres, and it's got some important neighbors. On the one side, we've got the 700-acre county park. On the other side, we've got some new residential development. So I want to think about how does more increased activity at, at the Northern State campus affect those adjacent areas. We want to think a lot about those historic and cultural resources that we've discussed a lot. Transportation. So we'll be doing analysis to look at if we project out having this much development on the site, well, how many traffic trips does that make for a day? How does that affect the commute on Highway 20 and the surrounding areas? We'll be looking at that and coming up with recommendations. In aesthetics, you know, a lot of um, the importance of the site, as Jeff mentioned, is in the, the feel and character of this place. So what's new development gonna, going to do? Um, how is that going to impact the existing character and feel of that place? And how do we set up a process for design guidelines and review of new buildings to make sure that anything that gets built is compatible with that character, that we protect that? And public access and recreation is another important consideration for us. As we had those meetings last year for that adaptive reuse study, one of the most common comments that we heard from the public was about wanting to have more access to the property. People realize it's a, a tremendous state public asset up there. They hear about these beautiful buildings, but when you go up the road, you just see a big stop sign saying restricted access, you cannot come. So thinking about ways that we could open up more public access to the site while still being you know, respectful of safety opportunities operations um, for the tenants that are there. Um, public services. Um, the site is fully served by um, water, sewer, and power. Um, and we want to think about, <clears throat> excuse me, we want to think about as we increase development up there, is there more demand for water, more demand for power? How does that service occur? What are the implications for that? I want to think about economics. Um, we're going to have hopefully some new job creation out there. So how many jobs? And if we're going to be taking out some of those incompatible buildings, are we going to be losing jobs by doing that? And what's our net balance there? To think about what's going to be the overall economic impacts of development of the site. And as we uh, transition here in a couple minutes to the public comment period, we would like to hear from you, are there any other items that we should be adding to this list? Are there any particular concerns that you would like to see us address in the environmental review process? So, as Aaron mentioned in the beginning, um, we want to hear comments tonight, both if you're willing to come up and speak, um, if you're like me and don't like public speaking all that much, you can just write them down on the card, leave them on the back table, or if you want to think about it a little bit, um, we have John Coleman is, the, is going to be the lead official for the city, he's the city's planning director um, for this environmental review process. His phone number, his email are up there, and they're also on the information sheet that you all got today. Um, so please, please feel free to contact him. Um, this public comment period um, was initiated when we sent out a public notice on April 14th, so it'll it'll close on May 14th or 15th? On May 15th. Um, so we've got you know about 10 days to get to get public comments in. And as I said, these are comments just on this initial scope of what should we study. We'll come back when we actually have the draft study and again ask for public comment and give you uh, since we'll be in the summertime then we'll give you an even longer comment period um, to allow people to be on vacation and still get to uh, look through those documents and give us feedback. Okay. I just want to thank you again for coming tonight. Uh, we'll set the podium up over here so you can comment to the consulting team. They'll be taking notes. Um, what's that? Oh, 
We Wait. skipped Peter. Yeah, we. Oh, I thought you were going to do that. <laughs> oh. Well, and, and we didn't get Becky either. Yeah. So oh, great. Well, and we'll uh, we'll bring Peter Janicki up now and uh, hear from him a little bit about his vision for the campus on the site. Then we'll go to the comments. Yeah, well, we got Rebecca still. And then we got Rebecca too. <laughs> so a couple, a couple so, more people. Um, we'll start. Let's start with Rebecca. Okay. Uh, Rebecca's with uh, Public Health in the county, and I talked about those four tracks. She's working with the county on the fourth track about the mental health services and needs at the at, that are out on the campus now. I'll be very brief. I'm I'm Rebecca Clark and I work with Skagit County Public Health. I'm the Human Services Manager and so my role is to look at the mental health um, services in the county. That's our behavioral health and it, will, it also includes substance use um, services. And what the county is going to be doing is working with the North Sound Mental Health Administration the North Sound Mental Health Administration is going to be reopening the 16-bed evaluation and treatment center, which is located out at the Northern State Campus, um, hopefully by July. That's the planned reopen date. And um, there is a three-year lease. So for that 16-bed facility, we'll have three years to provide that inpatient 14-day service for individual people with mental illness who need stabilization. There is also a facility at the campus called Pioneer Center North. It's a 60-day inpatient unit for individuals with substance use disorders, chronic substance use disorders. That is um, funded by the state. It's administered by the state. But as of next April, the North Sound Mental Health Administration, which currently just administers funds for mental health services, will also take on the funds that serve um, individuals with substance use disorders. So. The idea is that it will be integrated services and that funding will no longer have these two silos of mental health or substance use. Um, and so what we're hoping to do is work with North Sound Mental Health Administration, which will become the Behavioral Health Organization. And it's a five, there's a five county region. It's Snohomish, Whatcom, Skagit Island, and San Juan. And we will um, work with all of those counties to develop alternative sites for the in, um, ENT, which is the Evaluation and Treatment Center, and also Pioneer Center North. And um, we're going to start with meetings in June. And I understand we'll be meeting monthly, and there'll be lots of opportunity for public comment for that process. And it'll be a, a wide cross-section of stakeholders. And um, once the information is confirmed about when the next or the first meeting is going to be set up that will be on the county website. So I think that's essentially what I wanted to say, and thank you all for coming. Thanks, Rebecca. And then uh, Peter, if, uh, Peter uh, Janicki, as you know, has proposed Janicki Bioenergy to be one of the first occupants of the site uh, when the project goes through. And Peter, if you are willing to be gracious enough to say a few words for us about your vision. Is turned here. The wrong way? First of all, I want to thank all of the different government organizations that have been putting this together. It's, you know, we see so much things in government that don't work, and this has just been absolutely amazing. So I want to just thank everybody. Um, it started with my first meeting with Patsy, so thank you. Uh, so my vision of this site is um, a campus. Okay. I don't want to move this business onto an industrial park because it has such an international connection and I've traveled all over the world and I expect ministers and dignitaries and people from, I mean on any given day there should be a hundred people from out of the country visiting the site from 
Africa, from India, from Mexico, from Brazil, from Russia, from, you know, and these are going to be business people, they're going to be government people, they're going to be just, and, and so uh, we want to bring them onto a campus that is just this high technology campus that's doing all of this amazing stuff, and they're going to want to see what we're doing. And because there's so much of this international connection, we're going to need a lot of office space. Unlike at Janicki Industries right now, where we mostly build stuff, uh, we're going to be coordinating the activities of things all over the world. And so it's going to require a lot of administrative people to be figuring out how to get this shipping container to here, to there, and to set up permits, and to be um, dealing with manufacturing that's happening all over the world. Uh, so I see that kind of a climate. And the other thing that's going to be happening on this campus is every single machine in the world will be monitored 24 hours a day and run 24 hours a day from Cedar Woolley. Okay, so there will be a command and control center that will look like the Houston, you know, uh, NASA center, uh, where we're running all of this equipment. So we expect to have hundreds of monitors with, you know, major computers uh, driving all of this from all over the place. So uh, that's kind of my vision. And sometimes when I look at that campus today, I think it's. It's a bit ambitious, <laughs> but I, I, I believe that we're going to get there. And uh, if you look at, you know, Janicki Industries over the last 20 years, um, you know, we roughly have about 700 people there today. It took about 20 years to get there. Uh, we already have about 50 people, full-time employees in this company, and we haven't really even started yet. And I expect that we're going to have over 100 people working um, before the end of this year. So I, I can see the trajectory is happening at a way faster pace, and uh, I also have a lot better financial support with the Gates Foundation. If you'll just bear with me, I, I got this email today, and I thought it was just so uh, telling we have about 3,000 of these in our inbox, if you can imagine that. I don't even know how you deal with 3,000 emails. But this particular one was uh, in some ways typical of what we're seeing around the world, and it tells you just how, um, how important this project is and how, I think, possible it is because it does something that hasn't been done in sanitation before. It makes it profitable for the entrepreneur. So everywhere else people like put in a well, that there's no money revenue, and once it stops generating revenue, it, the, the thing breaks down and it stops working. Where we believe with this equipment, the way we've set it up financially, uh, somebody's going to make a lot of money. And so they're not going to want to shut the machine off. They're going to want to maintain it and run it because it generates revenue while doing all the things that other things are supposed to do. So this is actually from a contractor that is um, being contracted by the U.S. military um, in Afghanistan. And bear with me, this will take about five minutes to read. Uh, my name is J.C. Lane. I'm an advisor stationed near the northern city of mazar e sarif Forgive me if I can't pronounce that. At Camp Marmel in Afghanistan. I'm conducted by the U.S. Army to aid and assist the Afghans in their daily struggle to perform life support contracts. Mostly I do this for the Afghan National Police. They need clean water sources, and we are definitely in crisis mode here. But the country as a whole needs your help with this issue. Water is synonymous with life and with death. This is certainly the case in Afghanistan. I saw Mr. Gates drink the water from the waste and I heard this system called the Omni Processor. Although I understand it has been designed for countries like African, Africa, Afghanistan needs it now. Most Afghans do not have access to clean drinking water, despite billions of dollars invested by international communities. My belief this is partly a result of complex systems that simply don't work in a nation like Afghanistan. The processor, we believe, will work this and will help provide power, which is another main concern, in addition to drinking water and getting rid of human waste in an efficient manner. But the main issue is the critical need for viable, simple water source solution to help stem the death rate of the children that we are seeing here now. Today in Afghanistan, waterborne diseases are common. The level of diarrhea and dysentery, especially among small children, are epidemic. Also, <coughs> excuse me, a large number of people suffer from cholera because of the drinking water. <clears throat> Most of the children admitted to the hospital here where I am suffer from diseases caused by the impurity of water. 
The majority of the country gets its water from wells and storage tanks. Collecting water is most often a task assigned to women and children, usually girls. In most areas of the country, they walk miles to find water that is contaminated and then carry it back in large, heavy containers. The usual method of containing the water is with manual hand pumps that are difficult to use. For children, the task is particularly arduous. The lack of clean drinking water is killing the Afghan children. <clears throat> According to this survey done by the United Nations, one out of every 10 children in Afghanistan will die before their fifth birthday. Shortages of water peak during the months because of the shortage of water farmers need to irrigate. Uh, let me just skip over a couple of this. The lack of clean water, even access to water that exists, threatens the presence of the future development in Afghanistan. It would be groundbreaking news if you could help us out here by using uh, Afghanistan as a test site for your developed processor. Please get back to me. Help would be greatly appreciated. Um, Let me just skip over a couple things here. The processor is a processor indeed. We see it as the processor for life. Um, thank you so very much. Uh, we hope to hear from you soon, JC Lane. That's all I got. Thanks, Peter. So Aaron uh, gave us our instructions on comments. All right, thanks, Peter, very much for that. Um, we are recording comments tonight with the help of a court reporter, so when you come up to the microphone, if you'd like to make comments orally, please state your first name and spell your last name for the record. Also, if you have not signed in in the back, I'll put a sign-in sheet right up here. Uh, that will help the court reporter to accurately reflect your name in the transcript of the record uh, for tonight. And finally, the written comments will be accepted here at City Hall through May 15. So if you're not ready to comment tonight, you want to do it in writing, that's perfectly fine. You can leave those with us tonight or get them back to City Hall until May 15. So uh, with that, we'll, we'll, the consultant group uh, will be here until the last person's done commenting. And again, if you've got questions, uh, put your question out there either in writing or orally and that will be responded to as part of the planning process. So uh, it's not going to be a colloquy tonight, but we will note the questions and get back to you with answers. So with that, are there any questions about the public comment process tonight? All right, well seeing none, I'm going to turn the microphone over to you and thank you all very much for coming to participate. If I can start by um, reading the names of those that have signed up to speak. Uh, I assume I'm facing uh, something other than a blank wall. I, uh, is this okay? Uh, my name is Jim Johnson. I live at 587 Carter Street. Uh, let me say I'm very supportive of the project. Uh, the earlier proposal some time back for a resort uh, motorsport complex, uh, I felt was without redeeming merit uh, whatsoever. Uh, this, I think, is a very viable and positive project. Um, let me start by saying that uh, uh, McGarkle will be one of the access points, uh, the routes uh, to the Northern State Campus it in Fruitdale. Uh, some years back, the city built a, extended the sidewalk along McGarkle and built a wonderful bike path on the other side, which gets a lot of use. If uh, the Janicki proposal it employs ultimately a thousand people. Uh, seems to me that's about 700 vehicle trips each way, morning and evening. Uh, I don't know that McGarrickle would get the bulk of it. I'm not trying to pawn it off onto uh, Fruitdale. My seatmate is very uh, uh, upset about that. But uh, McGargle does have uh, an elementary school. Uh, many kids from the Cascade Middle School walk home along it and has a boys and girls club. So, uh, and one of the 
So I'm not primarily upset about invasion of my privacy uh, and the noise. I am concerned about the safety of those kids. And especially in a time when we're encouraging kids to walk, get some exercise, get off your duff, you'll get diabetes if you don't get outside the house. Uh, we want them to walk safely. Uh, and also complicating things morning and night. Uh, some folks, for whatever reason, feel compelled to take their kids to and from school. So there's a minor traffic jam is too strong a word, but there's a minor traffic bottleneck already. So I think access uh, to uh, the Northern State Complex, safe access, is a real concern. And neither McGarkle or Fruitdale are, I think, designed to handle a large amount of traffic. Uh, that said, within the complex, uh, I'm a, I'm a retired educator, uh, and as a result, I will be the first to admit that school doesn't work for all, everybody. But I do strongly believe in Job Corps. Job Corps is one of the tenants there. And I think that any time we give young people a second or a third chance even to become a viable, productive citizen, we're doing something good for them, and we're doing something good for all the rest of us. So I hope the uh, complex is compatible uh, with the Job Corps, with the maintenance of the Job Corps. Um, I, too, would like to see the buildings maintained, and, and I've been reassured, uh, maintained, and, and uh, re revitalized, and it looks like there's a process for doing that. So I'm, I've been very encouraged about what I've heard there. Uh, finally, I'll, uh, uh, I'll keep it short, or I'll try to short it here. I'm uh, one of those Audubon people who were out there counting the Swifts that you alluded to. Uh, they roost uh, in the old northern state smokestack. Uh, both in their southerly migration to Mexico, in their northerly migration through Washington, Oregon, and on up to the coastal rainforest in British Columbia. Uh, I've counted there several times. I recall the, the highest count, I think, was 16,200 one evening. Uh, although I have to admit there's a little guesswork in there when you <laughs> see <laughs> these little guys spiraling down into their uh, area. Uh, it's, it's quite a spectacle. And uh, formerly they used to roost in old growth. Uh, and of course throughout much of their range we've removed the old growth. They've adjusted to these large chimneys. And uh, lest it sound just like a, a a resurrection of the snail darter will, that will stop every project dead in its tracks. Uh, communities, you mentioned Monroe, and in uh, Portland on the east side, have uh, both of these sites are elementary schools, and they've created public festivals uh, around these where they get a lot of folks turn out, set out chairs, have guest speakers, maybe some concessions. Uh, I, I, I don't know. But in other words, it's, it's a potential, if not a money maker, something in some very positive way to put the community on the map. In, in, in addition to what I think the intent of uh, the Janicki Industries here is to do, to, to put a positive spin on our community and provide a real service. So I have some concerns. But what I've heard tonight is quite positive, and what I've seen around the perimeter. Thank you. Okay, Tom Thompson. My name is Tom Thompson, T H O M P S O N. I've always felt that the highest and best use for this facility out here was its original purpose, that of providing housing and treatment and care of uh, the people in this state, the citizens of this state, uh, that have mental issues. However, uh, given its present state, I think the direction that we're moving now is, is probably the best thing for it. I'm not in favor of 
the uh, the first alternative of just letting the place sit and motor away, which it will do if nothing is done out there. Uh, the next two alternatives are becoming more increasingly uh, active in the environmental field and development of, of uh, businesses that have to do with that it seems like the best thing to do right now at this point. Uh, now I have a question and I hope you can answer it for me. Uh, I belong to the Wildcat Steelhead Club and we have been in the process of getting the permits to do a little dredging on that pond that's on the site where we hold the uh, the kids derby every year. Uh, you people probably have children or been out there yourself at one time or another at that derby. It's been there a long time. Um, Right now, the county is the lead agency for the SEPA review, and we've, we've submitted all the applications. Uh, the SEPA finding was of non-significance as far as the county goes, and it's, it's out for uh, comment right now. It should be done here pretty quick. My question is, if the city becomes the lead agency for SEPA reviews in that area, how is that going to affect us? We want to get this work done by by uh, the warm season and the August-September time frame this year. We've been at this for two years now trying to get the permitting done. Uh, how would that affect our plans right now if the city becomes a lead agency in that time? Can anybody answer that? I can answer that very quickly. Um, the lead agency status would remain with the county, so not the city, for the purpose of your permit this year. Thank you. Uh, just for your information, uh, the work we want to do is, is uh, dredging of the pond, uh, probably between 50 and 200 cubic yards of sediment that have uh, filled in that pond over the years. The pond originally was 12 to 18 feet deep, and now it's uh, four, six feet deep average across the pond and it, and it makes a really tough time for uh, for the kids to, or for us, to provide a good fishing situation for the kids. And it's a maintenance kind of thing, uh, although it has never been done before and that pond, that dam was put in oh, 60 years ago. Uh, before permitting of such things was even thought of, and uh, but at any rate, uh, it's a, it's a maintenance thing which wouldn't occur very often, and uh, it, the finding of non-significance by the county uh, is a testament to the fact that it wouldn't hurt a thing. It'll improve the situation for the kids out there. We're also going to have the county spray. Uh, the uh, yellow flag iris, which is an invasive, noxious weed uh, that grows around the edge of that thing, and it's the county's purview to get rid of that stuff. So uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Bob Ruby. <laughs> I'm going to boldly turn the podium. Just so <laughs> I can look, look at him directly. Perfect. I'm Bob Ruby, R-U-B-Y. Um, I also am very supportive of uh, the, the project, the proposal, and the, the, the work that we're discussing here tonight. Uh, to the extent that it, it's scoping for the EIS, I'd like to add my two cents and hopefully provide some constructive uh, direction. Uh, notwithstanding, the, the city, many of who are here tonight, uh, representatives including, I'm going to name uh, Mark Freiberger by name, the city council, the mayor, have worked tirelessly the last few years and done a, a huge amount of infrastructure development here, which is um, nothing but positive in setting this, this stage. Um, I'm sure with the economics that the group will be looking at 
uh, the surrounding community in addition to the 230 acres that is up there on some level or capacity. I would encourage <clears throat> this group to do a lot of work and provide direction is, is would be my request in the scoping part of this on the effect of this uh, on the local economy on the on the infrastructure within the corporate lip, limits in town and the impact of that and if I'm not hearing any objection to that, I might even boldly ask the group to perhaps even offer some alternatives on how the community may, as a continuing process, work on that. I know we have a wonderful planning commission here. There's, there have been ad hoc groups um, and other bodies but to um, see if, if maybe in, in your experience and in other areas where this type of thing may have occurred, what, what have other small jurisdictions done and how can we best help ourselves in, in the city and, and in the incorporated limits um, so that we can remain proactive here. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Good evening. My name is uh, Dick Nord, N O R D. I live at 107 South Third in Lacana, but I am a property owner in Cedar Valley. Uh, a few years ago, a group of citizens came together and decided that, uh, and people have been working on a long time to try to figure out how the property at Northern State could be transferred from the state into local control because the theory was that without being in local control it was going to be extremely difficult to do anything positive with that property and that was a few years ago and it's been an interesting process because uh, between the port and the city and the county uh, and I've attended most of the meetings uh, that uh, they've done an incredible job of working together to bring a kind of a cohesive group and there have been many comments made at the meetings I've been at that this is one of the first times ever, anybody's ever seen this many bureaucratic people and politicians uh, come together in a common in a common way to do something positive in the community. And that really hasn't changed. I, I think what's, what you guys are doing, they, they've hired a great group of people. I'm a mobile builder and developer. I've been doing this for a long time. And you guys have uh, the county and the city and, and uh, thank you. You've hired a great group of, of professionals to come in and do a dynamite job here. And uh, I think what we're going to end up with is a, is a wonderful result. Yeah, the icing on the cake is the Janikis that came along later and said, God, this would be a great place. This is our hometown. We want to have something happen here that's positive for the community, that's absolutely the most noble project you can think of, that's going to help people all around the world, and we can all be part of that. Uh, there's a couple things that uh, I think are important. Uh, well, first of all, I, I hope, you know, having gone through the EIS uh, proposals myself over a period of years that you that you pick the toughest and the highest and the best density we can get in that place because we never know quite what's going to happen in the future and the fact that you'll get things approved in that location that are potential in the, in the future may not happen in the period of time you've got proposed in other words you've got a 15 years proposal time out there that may not happen maybe the Janikis will do things in other places and maybe they won't grow as fast as we think but if we if if you, if you cut yourself short in the proposal to do the environmental impact statement uh, for the highest density you can get, you're making a terrible mistake. Because to go back and do it in another five or six years or ten years and decide you want to go from a moderate proposal to a high density proposal is going to be real pain in the butt. I mean, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to get any easier, believe me. Uh, and uh, I also hope that what you guys will consider is, besides the thousand some odd jobs that the Janikis hopefully, hopefully will be putting on this site over the next few years, is that uh, there'll be uh, there's a, there's an additional 
opportunity for jobs, and I'm concerned about jobs in this community. I'm concerned about kids coming out of school, and the fact that these guys are going to bring in high-paying jobs to this community is incredibly important. And uh, but there's going to be other jobs, As, and I know a part of your part of your impact statement will will, will consider the number of jobs during the course of construction and, and, and uh, the. Uh, for the landscaping and the building demolition and all the things that go with that and and uh but there's a tremendous number of offsite jobs that this project is going to create in this community, which is going to have another impact on the environment, and that's going to affect, as Bob Ruby just said, the periphery of this, this site. And I think that's an important consideration, too. But I was, really hope that you guys would emphasize the positive side of the job creation, and not just the Janicky job creation or the site job creation, but the job creation that will go on with that many jobs that will impact this community in an incredibly positive positive way. And lastly, I want to tell you that Cedar Ridge is in a, is in a wonderful community, and they've and those of you that don't know, they're about the number three graduating rate high school in the uh, state of Washington, and they went from a long way down to get there, and uh, it speaks incredibly well for this community, and I, I think this community will rally dramatically behind this, and so my compliments to everybody for doing a great job, but just uh, so far, go stop. Thank you. Hi, my name is Karen Dinkins, D-I-N-K-I-N-S. Um, I live on the backside of Northern State off, off of Helmick Road. Um, it's been sad to see the uh, how the buildings have deteriorated on the backside of the, the complex. <clears throat> I'm really here for one reason, and it's kind of selfish. I also am a member of the Wildcat Steelhead Club. I'm very supportive of the project, but I'm also very concerned about the recreation of the, the juvenile pond for fishing, which is open for fishing for kids throughout fishing season. I want to make sure that that remains intact for use, as well as available for the kids' derby to, to be held every year. Um, so I, I'm supportive. I, I, I believe that, that the um, existing or status quo is really not an option. Um, I, th I think that that would be sad to see all of the, the historical buildings um, continue to fall. So. Hi, I'm Paula Kelly, uh, resident of Cedar Valley. Last name is K-E-L-L-E-Y. Um, I'm also the director of the Chamber of Commerce here in town. And the Chamber Board voted, you know, to completely support uh, this uh, plan for changes up at Northern State. We've been supportive of change there for a long time because the amount of jobs lost in the 70s um, due to the closing in Northern State, to the closing of uh, Skagit Corporation, and then the loss of the mills had a significant economic impact on our city. And the resilience of our city is what's amazing, is we survived, we have not thrived. What we want to see is something that can help bring back the kind of community we once had. Um, it's amazing to me to see that change is already occurring downtown and people's attitudes are improving significantly with just the idea that this may happen. Um, lady walked into the chamber today and says, now where's that Taco Bell going? And I'm like, um, I don't know. <laughs> I hadn't heard about that yet. Um, I've had uh, a hotelier approach me and looking at where can we build. Um, 
those are the kind of things that we've been looking for for a long time. And they're going to create jobs as well. Um, when I was a young girl, my aunt was a resident up on North, at Northern State. And I went up there with my mom on Sundays to pick her up and take her out to dinner. And it was such a such a uh, interesting place to go to because one it was one of the most beautiful places I could imagine. Uh, even today when I go up there, the uh, old trees, the poplars and things, they don't look so good. The grass isn't quite as pretty as it used to be. And maybe that's the perception of a kid as opposed to a 65 year old woman. But um, the buildings then were beautiful. And I always loved the stained glass and everything else. So of the integrity of the buildings, I love the fact that you intend to try to maintain that. But no, um, the idea that nothing happens there, that's not possible. Something will occur. And unfortunately, if we do nothing, it will be just entropy. This will be uh, further degradation of the buildings, of the campus. And you talked uh, about coming onto the campus and how the public would like to be able to have better access to it. Um, the other day I was up there for a luncheon with the Job Corps. And I completely love the Job Corps people. They've done wonderful things for our community. Um, and uh, I counted the number of signs you got to before you got to the gate. And there were four basically saying, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, it was like, oh my gosh. Uh, and then of course you go through the gate and there's more signs. Um, it, it needs to be available to the, you know, to the community. It needs to have growth. It needs to be something we can be proud of again. And um, one of the things that um, was said a long time ago by Gandhi was, be the change you want to see in the world. And I am, I'm raised at Peter's concept here. It is incredible to think that our town could be the leader in changing the world. So we're for this. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Don Wick. I'm with the Economic Development Association of Skagit County, and our mission is to enhance the quality of life through the uh, uh, creation and preservation of jobs and uh, healthy businesses, and uh, certainly the uh, partnership between the, the jurisdictions here has been just really impressive to see, so congratulations to, to all of you. Uh, the spirit of Cedar really, uh I moved here in 19, I came here in 73 to work at another job, and uh, right when Northern State was just about closing. And uh, to see the spirit of this community here with Northern State closed schedule manufacturing, it just has been so impressive. This community just has such a spirit. And uh, I, I have been on so many committees at Northern State. We hosted a dinner out there in the late 80s with the, the governor. All this was to look at the future of Northern State. What else can we do on that site? And uh, in this project, the Janicky Bio Energy comes along. Of all the companies we work with to draw to Skagit County, this thing is head and shoulders above anything we've ever worked with in the type of jobs it creates. And to hear Peter and Susan Janicky and how they they can get filled with emotion about the 
the intent of this project, and as Dick Nord said, the, the noble intent of this project and what it will do in the world is just, it just, it, it moves me so much, and I know others too that have, that have heard, heard Peter and Susan talk about this and talk about what a difference it will mean in the world. It's just such an opportunity, and, and what it'll do for this community here and the whole region, and what's called the multiplier effect of the jobs that were created here, the just top quality jobs and how that will multiply through our region and create other jobs and, and create tax revenues for county government and cities. It's just, it, this is a once in many lifetime opportunity. So congratulations to all the jurisdictions, to, to Peter and Susan uh, Janicki and the Janicki family, and so to all of you here tonight and the concerns you do raise about the programs that are there. I know the Janikis have such an earnest desire to make sure that um, all of those are dealt with very appropriately. So, so thank you so much for the time this evening. My name is uh, Jim Anderson, A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. And uh, my comment is uh, with regards to uh, bringing so much land into the uh, city. I want to make sure that, uh, well, any time that you bring this much land into a, a city limits, you should consider the schools. And uh, I think that's an important issue that hasn't been brought to light here. Uh, some land should be set aside for school zoning, uh, whether it's on this side or someplace else. Uh, you're talking about creating a lot of jobs, so that's a lot of new families in the area. And any time that you uh, put forth a development like this, that's an important issue. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, I'm Glenda Alm, ALM. I live at 11453 Bayview Edison Road in Mount Vernon. Um, I would just, I, I think things sound good as far as I can see, and, and I'm all behind this. I just want to make sure that before you fill in all those intense uh, places, that you walk those creeks and you look in those meadows and you um, be a part of those old growth trees. It's a fantastic site, wildlife site. And let's uh, make sure we save some of that um, because once that wellness is gone, it can't be recaptured. I'd like to speak here. Yeah. Can get up. <laughs> My name is Don Collin, C-O-L-L-E-N, and uh, I'm also a member of the Wildcat Steelhead Club. And I've known these Janicky kids since they were born. I've known their, their dads and their moms. And I even knew Grandpa Janicky. Now there's a real guy, now let me tell you. But anyhow, as efficient and knowledgeable as these people are, these Janickys, I don't believe they're capable of doing anything harmful to the city of Cedar Valley or the people around. Thank you. speak with um, our school superintendent, Phil Brockman, and Phil has um, one of the um, general areas of growth that's been uh, projected for the city of Cedarilla and allowed for in the urban growth plan is north of the city, um, heading north on Highway 9, and um, I asked him about the possibility of further development up at Samish uh, grade school, and he said there's plenty of room to, do it, to develop that further. So just uh, mentioning that. Please fill those out, send them in, leave them, drop them off, um, and 